Hello everybody, welcome to this week's session. I'm Amanda Rosevorn and we have Daniel Still here from the CPD Standards Office and a very special guest speaker today, one of our CPDSO accredited speakers, Barnaby Winter. So we're delighted to see so many of you joining us from all corners of the globe. We'll be covering today particular topics around branding and marketing and this is where Barnaby is an absolute guru. And so it's wonderful to see you all here today. So just to hand over to Daniel, he's going to talk you through the etiquette and some of the chat and Q&A sessions that we've got to uh, just run over quickly before we introduce Barnaby. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it's Daniel here. I'm sure many of you are familiar with my voice, if not my face yet. So just going to run through a few things uh, for housekeeping. I can already see uh, Helen over there. You've got your, your video on every, hey Helen. If we can get our videos off, please, it's gonna really help with the, the bandwidth and just maintaining that so we've got a good experience going on. So can everyone just turn off their videos? It would be greatly appreciated. Um, hey Jane, thank you. And I think, oh, Jonathan there as well, Jonathan Priest. So if, if we can get all the videos off, that would be much appreciated, guys. Uh, next one is chat. So with the chat, uh, we are going to have the chat open, so you are going to be able to com communicate. We just ask that you um, keep the communications focused on what our presenter is going to be talking on. Uh, if you have any questions, that's going to be a perfect thing to put into the chat because we are going to be coming to those all at the end of today's session. So please do use the chat uh, wisely. Uh, for any questions, please do put them in the chat. And if you've got any nice comments to say like, oh, that was an amazing point or anything like that, Feel free to share that as well. Right, so today we have another poll. Uh, today, basically, is, is um, today's webinar was set up and planned off the back of last week's poll. Um, so that was, uh, so yeah, we're really looking to serve you guys and obviously to um, give you guys what you're asking for. So we thought we would run another poll this week uh, to have a look at what are some of the other topics that you are all interested in uh, hearing us um, bring content to you about. So without further ado, let's get the poll going. Sorry guys, I put out the wrong poll. <laughs> this poll is actually about if you are a member or a non-member. So yes, please answer this poll. The other poll is going to be coming after Barnaby's speak, speech um, presentation. So yeah, thank you for the answers. They're coming in fast. So thank you so much for participating in this poll. Essentially, we just need to understand our audience and who we're talking to. Um, we're delighted to welcome so many members, but also so many of you that are part of the CPDSO community and potentially joining us soon as a member. So absolutely, a huge welcome to everybody. We've still got a few people coming into the room, so I'm just going to allow a few more uh, moments for them just to get the answers on the poll. Um, I can still see a few videos uh, on. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Priest, hey there, mate. Looking cool in your glasses. <laughs> can we get the Can we get the video off, please? So uh, yes, perfect. just to end the poll now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. Okay, Amanda. Yeah, so just to sort of reiterate, Daniel, um, we would absolutely enjoy all of you um, today on the um, session with us. Um, for GDPR reasons and privacy uh, legislation, we do ask that you do keep your videos switched off throughout the entire um, presentation, and um, mainly because that's going to be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. So if you could keep your videos off, that would be great. Um, we'll, we'll, you're, you're set to mute, <laughs> not that that's a, a personal uh, offence against you. And uh, yes, without further ado, let's crack on. So thank you. So today we're going to essentially be covering a 50 minute webinar. Um, we've followed, as you know, many sessions over the last couple of weeks. And um, we've responded very quickly from our member survey and as Daniel mentioned, from our polls 
to just understand what it is that you need, those of you that are in our CPDSO community and working in the training, coaching and education industries through this very strange, I'm not going to use the word unprecedented today, um, but through this absolutely, you know, unreal world that we find ourselves in. And so on the poll last week, many of you um, requested some support with marketing, with digital branding, and just kind of um, how you can promote yourselves wisely on the net. So we're going to have our 50 minute session with Barnaby Winter, and the recording and the slides will be available after the session. And so will um, any Q and A's that you ask, we'll, we'll create a separate little document for you. So I hope you enjoy the session today. As Daniel says, please do use the chat to ask questions, but we will be uh, taking a question and answer session at the end. So over to Barnaby. Welcome Barnaby, absolutely delighted to have you here this afternoon and looking forward to you sharing your very wise, very experienced expertise with us. So thank you. So we're just switching screens now, so Barnaby uh, can push and uh, get ready to promote his session. Thank you, Amanda. It's, um, marketing's fundamentally changed. And what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about now is essentially how it's changed, why it's changed, what you can do about it as trainers, coaches, and really to develop your business um, as we speak right now. I'm going to go through the seven pillars that are really enable you to supercharge your brand in the digital economy. Now my story starts on a shopping trip. I don't know if you are familiar with shopping trips. I have three daughters. Kimberly, newly qualified as a doctor in her third week in a uh, post-COVID ward. Uh, Claudia, who was thrown out of her university uh, without sitting her finals and doesn't know if she's going to graduate or not, uh, but has a job to go to later on in the summer. And Jasmine, who was also thrown out of uh, university uh, from Nottingham uh, at the end of her third year. So when you have three girls, wherever you go across the world, you have to build in a shopping day to every trip. So a few years back, we were in Paris. We were visiting Disney. Disney's my thing. I believe you, if you really care about brands, you have to go to Disney every two years because it is one of the best expressions of brand that you'll ever have. So we're in the Marne Valley. We built in a shopping day in central Paris. And on the list is a shop called Abercrombie & Fitch. Now, I don't know if many of you know Abercrombie & Fitch, but it's a place that dads should not take their daughters and a credit card. Uh, it's where there are fun, fantastic clothes uh, for young uh, teenage girls in particular. So we take the metro into central Paris, and we end up at the Arc de Triomphe end of the Champs-Élysées. I'm told that this Abercrombie & Fitch is on the Champs-Élysées. So we walk down it and an hour and a quarter later into a shopping trip, not my favourite day on a holiday, we have reached the Place de la Concorde end and we have not found this Abercrombie & Fitch. Now I'm getting a bit grumpy. The mobile phones are out, the maps are out and everything. Everybody's convinced it is on the Champs-Élysées. So we agree that we will go back up. It's meant to be on the left-hand side going up. And we go up and eventually we come across in the in the in the fence a sign in a fence this sign this must be the place and next to it are these beautiful ornate gates with two very fine looking young gentlemen stood either side of them so we approach the gates and they go no 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 mademoiselle you cannot come in you have to join the queue the queue? But the, how long is this queue? Uh, today it is about 45 minutes. 45 minutes? 
you're having a laugh, aren't you? I'm not queuing 45 minutes in to go into these gates to, to a shop I, I can't even see. So I'm out. So if you can see in the image to the right, there's some benches and people standing around. So I go and sit on these benches. My daughters and my wife join this queue. And lo and behold, 45 minutes later, they, they, they go in. So we're now two and a half hours into this shopping trip and we're only going into the first shop. So I think about, I write a lot, I write books, I write blogs, I do all those sorts of things. And I'm watching what's going on. And I notice that it seems like everybody walking out of Abercrombie and Fitch is carrying an Abercrombie and Fitch bag. So I count them because I'm sad and I don't get out very much. Uh, but now I'm legitimized because now I don't get out very much. And I count them. And in the first hundred that I count, 83 people are carrying an Abercrombie and Fitch bag. And I go, well, I must have miscounted. So I count another hundred and 81 people are carrying an Abercrombie and Fitch bag. And this got me thinking, what is going on here from a marketing point of view? Here is a shop that you cannot find. That when you do find it, you can't see it. You have to go down a little pathway through some gates to get to it. You have to then queue to get into it. And once you've got into it, you it ends up with an 82 percent conversion rate to sale now i don't know about you guys and there's a little button actually at the bottom of your page which does a little hand or, or or whatever but how many of you would like to have a business that nobody can find that when they do find it it's impossible to get around your website that actually they can't get hold of you and eventually when they do get hold of it, it leads to an 82% conversion rate. Who would like a business like that? Who would like a business like that? Stick your hands up if you'd like a business like that. Because what I'm going to attempt to do is to explain to you precisely how we can do that. And the first lesson that you need to learn is that it's not about selling anymore. Actually, it's all about how you buy, how you help people to buy. And that's the difference between what is going on with marketing today. Before, it was all about shouting at people and telling them you existed. But now, actually, the role of marketing is to help people to buy from you. Now, it doesn't really matter what you think, whether I th you think that's true or not. There was a book called The Challenger Sale came out about eight years ago. It's from an organization called CEB, a big organization that researches how people buy things. And in it, it said that actually what you have to do is challenge people. And, and so this was followed up then two years ago with a book called The Challenger Customer. And in this, it has one very key fact. And it's something you need to get your head around when it comes to marketing. And that is that when people contact you for the very first time, they've made 57% of the decision to buy from you. It means that they're more likely to buy from you than not buy from you when they contact you for the first time. Now, if you think about that, something is going on. And actually what we need to understand as business owners as trainers, as coaches, and people who are building businesses, that actually when people contact us, they're more likely to buy from us. And what we normally then do is we blitz them with loads of information about ourselves, which they already know. We don't need to do that anymore. Now, this is, you might say, well, that's all based on, 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 uh, on uh, Abercrombie and Fitch experience. So, which is a B to C, a business to consumer experience. Actually, aren't we better off um, talking about B2B. So, and isn't that different? Well, let me give you some thinking on this. First and foremost, if you look at the way businesses are laid out in the, in the UK, there are currently 4.7,000 businesses recorded. I expect there'll be a lot less at the end of this particular period. But of those, 4.5, Four, five, seven million, 76% have no employees at all. People like you and me, organizations which are running either as sole entrepreneurs, uh, sole traders, or indeed limited companies with no employees. I'm a director of a limited company, so I'm not qualified as an employee. 
at 76%. And what's also interesting in that is actually a further 1.15 million have less than nine employees. But actually when you average out precisely how many people they actually employ, what that equates to is a average of 1.6 people per company. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if you wake up in the morning and you say, do you know what, I'm a, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter, whatever it is. And you get to 9.30 in the morning, you go, goodness, it's 9.30 in the morning. I'm going to become a business person. I'm going to behave entirely differently until 5.30, at which point you return to being a father, mother, son, daughter, etc. Do you really think the way you make decisions changes during the course of your day? 95.6% of all businesses are run by one person. They are going to make decisions uh, in the same way buying either B2B or B2C. So I would conject that actually the decision making that people go through, whether it's B2B or B2C, is exactly the same. Now, you might argue that the big organizations are different. But actually, if you look at the way they've siloed, there's always one key decision maker. And it's in fact what was captured by the challenger sale, i.e. you had to find the challenger in an organization rather than sell to the board, selling to veto, those sorts of things, very important trading offices. So that's all changed. So B2B equals B2C. So the key thing at this moment in time is it is not about outbound marketing anymore. It's all about actually reeling people in back. It's a fly fishing job. What you've got to do is you've got to keep sending stuff out and nurturing and bringing people in a hundred pound fish on a two pound breaking strain line. You've got to let them work them in all of the time. And that's what characterizes marketing today. Marketing is about inbound activity, not outbound. It's not about advertising. Quite depressing for me. I started my career 33 years ago in the advertising industry. I became the youngest managing director of a top 200 advertising agency. I bought that agency in 2001 and I've subsequently moved away from advertising because advertising doesn't really work anymore. It's all about getting people to come into your business. Now it doesn't matter again whether you think that's right or whether you think that's wrong, but actually HubSpot, a huge organization that are specialists in, in um, CRM, advocate and their research shows that inbound marketing delivers 54% more leads into the marketing funnel than any other outbound leads. And actually, those inbound leads cost 61% less than outbound leads. So people are still doing outbound, but it's still very expensive. So again, as a business, spending money, shouting out at your marketplace is just not the right thing. However, what do we do? What do we do to really get hold of these people on their 57% journey. Well, one of the things that's really useful to know is that up to 88% of people undertake pre-purchase research. So before they buy anything, they go online. Now, what that actually means is that they wake up in the morning, they think they've got a challenge, an issue, a problem, and then what would you do? What would you do? You'd probably Google it. Well, the e-commerce foundation says that 54% will do that, 34% will do that uh, absolutely regularly, and only 12.5% don't go anywhere near the knowledge economy, the digital economy. This is also supported by Mary Meeker of Kleiner Perkins. Now, Mary Meeker has been doing research around the internet for, as far as I can remember, 25 years. Um, and again, 49% of all searches are, are on Amazon, and 36% of the searches are on, on on, uh, on Google, whatever, when looking for products. So just think about that in your business. What are you doing to be found by all of these people who've woken up with a problem? They kind of look for a solution. They find it, they type it in, and, uh, and there is a whole page full of stuff. What are you doing about being present there? Rather than depressing, though, having just got all my head around that, it all changed again. You see, um, CEB, which were the people behind Challenger Sale and Challenger Customer, got bought by Gartner. Now, Gartner's a huge research organization. It's about a year ago they bought them, and they've repeated the research and found out something newer still. 
And from a B2B point of view, they found out that 89% of B2B buyers are saying that when they go online, their regular sources of information are throwing up equally viable solutions to their already identified problem. And now they're confused again because the solutions aren't the same from reliable sources. In other words, they're encountering purchase process of high quality information from different groups. So we all as, as trainers and coaches, we're really good at, 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 at telling stories. It's all of high quality, but actually I remain confused as the buyer. And what that actually means is they found that the sense makers are the people who are closing more deals. So the people who are giving away great information, broadcasting it out, they're doing a pretty, pretty okay. They're doing 30%. It's okay. The people who are shouting out, telling good information, providing insights into the market, they're doing okay, get, you know, 50% successful. But the people who are making sense of all the information out there are the people who, who are doing the best. And this is where we as trainers, coaches, experts have something really, really valuable. You see, the thing is, we're all subject matter experts. We know our onions. We know what we're talking about. Otherwise, we wouldn't put ourselves in front of audiences and really ask them to challenge themselves, whether as a speaker, whether as a trainer, whether as a coach, it doesn't matter, a mentor. It really doesn't matter. We have to know our onions. So we have the potential to go into the marketplace and really make sense for people, help people understand their own buying decisions, give them their information to help them through that. So what we need to do today is we need to build our brands as go-to brands, a brand that makes sense so that actually your reputation, your presence in the marketplace as a brand is met with a, a sense of these guys are going to help guide me through a problem I might have they're going to find the best way of working with me do you know what the people on this call as far as i'm concerned are the best equipped to be able to do that because we are dedicated to helping people make sense of things teaching them guiding them giving them the knowledge and giving them the, the ability to go forward from a, a, a better place so we need to build go-to brands now, a lot of people talk about brand. Ask groups in, in the old days when you were a live audience, I would have asked you to shout out what you would have said a brand was. And I can tell you what you would all be thinking right now. If I said, what is a brand? You'd be saying, it's a logo. It's an identity. It's a mark of quality. It's what's going on in the, in the consumer's mind. It's a reputation. It's trust. It's, I've had them all. I've been doing this for 23 years. I've had them all. Don't you worry. I have a list of 74 different answers of what brand stands for. When I became Youngest MD, I joined an agency that had at its heart a thing called the Brand Bucket, a methodology first developed for Saab in 1985, applied to over 4,700 brands. Me personally, I've only done about 570 of them and has generated billions and billions of pounds of net profit. And I stood in my first board meeting at that agency and I said, I kind of know what a bucket is. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty damn obvious what a bucket is. Yeah, uh, I, I get that. But what's a brand? And we're, on that day, we had 148 person years of experience sat in the room. And between us, we filled seven sheets of A1 flip chart paper of what a brand was. Hmm. We couldn't do that. So I got sent away. Uh, to find a definition using some of the books that I have behind me here. There's loads with the word branding. Um, there's all, all, all sorts of, uh, of books with the word branding. None of them had a definition of branding. My own book has this definition that I'm about to give you. So we then spent three and a half months coming up with the following definition. And we define brand as every experience that affects the relationship between a product or service and its buyer. Now, let me explain that to you because it's really important you understand this. The first thing is a true brand can only exist in the mind of a buyer. Somebody who's exchanged money or which is a reflection of time. So they explain either time or money in exchange for your products or services, your, your, what you offer. 
Only at that point can they have a true sense of what a brand is. But the key to this is that a brand is a relationship. It's a relationship that I value more than I value the money in my pocket, which has taken me some time to earn. So you're gonna to have to really be convincing if you're gonna ask me to give you the money that took me some time to earn to give it to you. So you have to build relationships using marketing to that people value more than the money in their pocket. And if you do that, they're gonna give you the money in their pocket because they realize it's an investment that you're gonna give them something they could never achieve themselves. And so therefore actually, everything you do, every experience across your business, absolutely everything, must reflect the kind of relationship that you want to portray that makes the difference between the product or service that you're providing and its buyer. Brand is every experience that affects the relationship between a product or service and its buyer. Now, what we should be doing really is building those relationships. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take you through how we build those relationships in the second part of this session. And that actually relies on a whole system. So, and this is the system that I'm gonna give you in the, the, the seven pillars. The first thing you need is you need to have a story that makes sense to people when you tell it. Now we call this story a value proposition. That's its technical term. But it's a story that when you tell people it, they go, oh, I see why you could be worth more than the money in my pocket. Now, normally when you go out and you meet people, you have about 60 seconds to explain that story. You really mustn't waste it. And so many people do. I go on networking meetings and all sorts of things and people are asked to give a 60 second or a 45 second and they just blow it every single time. And they'll explain why. I don't know if any of you have actually been uh, networking in New York. So about seven years ago, when I was building my professional speaking career, I had this sort of weird thought that I might go and do some speaking in New York. So I went to New York and I ended up at a Chamber of Commerce networking evening, uh, networking lunch in uh, the Bronx. And they get one hour for lunch and I'm stood there suited and booted. I've got a drink in one hand, a bottle of oil on the other. And this large, slightly sweaty, rounded New Yorker comes up to me and says, hi. I'm Hank Weissmuller, what do you do for me? And I said, well, hi, I'm, I'm Barnaby from, uh, from the UK. I'm a professional speaker. I'm looking to develop my speaking portfolio here in, in New York. Oh, great. He said, uh, yeah, but what do you do for me? I said, well, actually what I talk about is a unique six step engagement model called the brand bucket, maps the journey from me. He goes, oh, okay, great, great, great. He said, but what do you do for, me? oh, you know what? Forget it. And he walked off. Now I can assure you, it's a very strange experience for a Brit like me. Um, to be confronted in that way. I didn't think I'd done anything wrong, but the clue was in the question. What do you do for me? You see, what we normally say in Britain is, what do you do? And then people go rattling off what they do. But actually, it's because we're conservative with a small c. We drop the for me. When anybody ever says to you, what do you do? They actually want you to answer the what can you do for them question. How can you make it easy to buy from them? from you have you got what they're looking for so a value proposition a six line beautifully crafted word by someone like me or a copywriter who says what you do that is not a value proposition it's not even an elevator pitch what you actually have to do is create a blended storytelling machine and we do that using the four b's and actually let me explain what that looks like so what you end up with is a tool that looks like this and we define four key areas the first one is we define our behaviors so what are the what's the style in with which you do business and i have to say guys this is the way you differentiate yourself more than any other it is the one key thing that differentiates you is your style because the chances are as trainers as coaches the buying community can hardly tell the difference between all of us. It's true of speakers, it's true of mentors, it's true of consultants, it's all of those things. 
They can't tell the difference. We all sound the same. Except, however, we all have a different style. And we buy from people we like who are like us. So, of course, we're going to be drawn to a style. So you have to define your behaviours. You also have to define what the benefits are of your organisation. What it is, is you're going to give people. What are you going to give them? You have to be able to say that off pat. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. And actually, it's also worth starting with beliefs. Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind. Is his second rule. His first rule is be proactive. And you're being proactive by being on these calls um, that are kindly put on by the CPD. But actually, what you should be doing is beginning with the end in mind. What do you want people to believe about you after you've spoken to them? That's how you make great marketing. And then what you need to decide on is what you want to be famous for. A single statement, a single approach, a single thing that you want to be recognized for. And I don't mean a color or, a, or anything like that. Something that has meaning to it. That people say they're the go-to person for this. That's what you need to do. That's a value proposition. What you're looking at right is really difficult because actually it's no longer about just about what you do or how you, or why you do it, but how you guide people through the buying process. So just telling people what you do, populating your website with features about your business, how long you've been going and all that stuff. I am not interested. What I want you to tell me is how can you make a difference to my life? And having got your value proposition, which is one part of the relationship, you've got to then define the other part of the relationship, which is your ideal prospect. And again, what people talk about a lot in the industry still, and I don't know why, is demographics. Some fraudulent methodology that was developed for the broadcast outbound industry to make sure that when you spent money on the magazine advertising and the exhibition and the email blast and direct mail, you didn't actually clock the fact that you're wasting 80% of your money talking to people who would never buy from you. That's what the role of demographics was. Now, from a business development point of view, you want this because you want to know there's a market there. But from a marketing point of view, absolutely no use at all. It's no longer effective as a targeting tool. So what you need to develop now is a psychographic profile. And that's how people think, how people feel, what their experiences of what you're doing, what they actually, what their expectation would be, what their ambition would be, what their aspiration would be. You need to profile your ideal target market that way. Because by doing so, you effectively address their value set. And in addressing their value set, you can then put your values in front of their value set and hey, you'll want to get married. Then it's just a question of getting people to effectively buy from you. Now, I don't know if you're familiar, you can see I've got three girls. This is uh, Brandy Melville in, in uh, Portugal. Now, I don't know if you know Brandy Melville, it's another fashion retailer, but the thing that's fascinating about Brandy Melville is that they only sell one size of clothes. That's it, one size. Um, which means everybody goes in there and it's either, it's either loose, it fits well, or it's a bit tight. But you have to be a certain body shape. And if you look at this image, the girls that are going in, there's a couple of chaps as well, but the girls that are going in are all sort of fitting a kind of generic body shape. Now, when you think about young people wanting to feel independent, be different, alter the thing, this is a group of, of, of people who, who psychographically are quite at one with going out and saying, I'm wearing Brandy Melville because I'm getting it. I'm of a certain style. I'm, into, I'm comfortable with who I am. It's a whole piece of psychology, Brandy Melville. Fascinating. They are psychographically led. And then what you need to do is systemize your, your marketing into three engagement levels. And we call this on the egg. And what actually we're talking about are three key steps to bringing people into your, into your bucket. What you have to do is you have to engage with them first. You then have to demonstrate your value and then you have to deliver on that at all times. So let's start with engagement because there are two key components to this. And the first key component is you, you need to raise awareness. You need to get known. Um, and there are loads of ways to do that. Your name is a good start. You can start your business. Um, uh, and like Thermos and Chapstick and Jumbotron and all of, the, all, all of those, Taser, Jacuzzi, these are all vernacular names. Very expensive, not something you or I probably are going to ever achieve. 
You can also do something for which you can be famous, like a tagline, and you'll, you'll may recognize many of these. Yeah, these are taglines. Again, it's a very expensive way of presenting your idea. So the thing that actually you probably can do is create what we call a brand property and get recognized. Now, I don't know if any of you know what this is and who this represents. Um, uh, just the number 57. I absolutely love it as a number. It's in all my number plates. I'm famous for it. And the reason why is because it's entirely made up. H.J. Hines made up the number 57. He called it 57 writers. You can see in the glass where it's in the bottle. Actually, Hines 57 is what they're famous for. It is a property that H.J. Hines chose to make famous. You can do that. These guys have a brand property. If you know it, that's not. If you don't, if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't know it, um, uh, I'm about to ruin your life. I have permission, hopefully, to ruin your life. And again, normally ask for everybody to say, "Can I? Can I ruin your life?" But in here is a brand property, and it's this. It's the arrow. Now, in showing you this, you'll never not see the arrow again. And actually, when we made uh, FedEx famous throughout Europe, um, we made the Arrow famous using TV commercials. My proudest work is one of these, um, which you see people wearing everywhere. Yeah, they changed it recently, but this lasted for 15 years and I was responsible for making this famous. And most recently, I have done this particular campaign uh, where, and I apologize if it's a sensitive area, um, but we created a valid proposition where in the middle it said we keep families together because they fund research that increases the chances of children surviving cancer. When they reach the end of their cancer treatment, they ring a, an, an end of treatment. And that became then the property, it then became the logo. They took their value proposition onto television. It is making them millions of pounds. They keep running the same commercial all the time. Uh, I do have it here, but I'm not going to show it uh, today. Um, um, so what it is, is taking the brand property and making ringing a bell famous and associating with that. And everybody gets it because it comes from the value proposition. Because at the time that that child rings the bell is when the family knows they're going to stay together because the child is free of cancer or in remission. You can do this as a culture trainer, something else. It's those of you that may know me or may not know me, you may have worked out what my brand property is. The second thing you need to do is you need to create the right kind of image dimensions. You need to get people to like you. And the way to do that now is to make sense of insight. You as trainers, we as coaches, we as mentors, consultants, whatever. We are full of insights. We should be blasting those out into the, into the great wide world through the social media. And we should be enabling people that when we blast them out to explain why it might work for them and why another insight might not work for them and own this subject matter expertise. People will then gravitate towards you when they're coming online with their, with their, their problem and see you as a recognized solution because you keep making sense for them. And make no mistake, it is going on. If you type in Abercrombie & Fitch online, what you'll see is they've got Facebook posts, they've got Instagram posts, they've got LinkedIn posts, they've got Twitter posts, they've got blogs, they've got uh, web, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Instagram, they've even, they're on TripAdvisor. Now, I don't know about you, but when you look at that screen, do you not see a shop? Do you not see people wearing the clothes, enjoying the clothes? Do you not think I'd like that top or I'd like that shirt or I'd like that blouse or I'd like that skirt? This is where the buying takes place because these guys are helping you buy so that you will go and queue for 45 minutes on a street in Paris to go through a gate into a shop where you don't even know they're stocking what you're looking for and still buy something when you go in there because you're committed to that relationship. Now, this is young people, B2C, I hear what you're saying, yeah, whatever, I'm a coach, I'm training on this, I'm HR, I'm, you know, nobody's going to buy that. Well, hold on, let's just look at Oracle. 
And then when you look at Oracle, you find they do exactly the same. And actually, I can find everything I need to know about Oracle just by going online. We can do this. You can populate all of this with really meaty stuff, videos, blogs, recordings, all that sort of thing. Just get all the stuff out there. A quick word on SEO. Um, a lot of people talk about that. It's not about keywords. So don't get stressed about that on your website. It's about relevance and authority. So Google have rewritten the algorithm and are looking for authority. You need to publish content that people who are authorities in your industry will link to and share. Because we're all connected as trainers and everything, we link up work collaboratively. And actually what that does is it creates algorithmic favorable things. The average blog post is now 500 words, but the average blog post on the front page of Google are 1500 words and the average blog in the top three is 2,500. We need to write long form copy. So to engage people at the top of the bucket, you've got to be recognized, create something that, for which you can be famous and then make sense of insights. So people find you, they recognize you and they really love what you're saying. That brings you onto the level, second level from engagement into demonstration. And there are two key components here. What are you gonna give people? You have to tell people what you're gonna give them because they're now saying, I've heard of you, I like you, tell me what you do for me. And you say, oh, we do benefits, benefits, benefits. Here they are. And you need to value. Now I love this formula for value from Heskett of Harvard Business School. Product quality plus service quality divided by price paid plus ease of doing business. Very, very smart, very clever. But what's interesting about it all is Gallup has done some research on them and found this, that the perception of value comes 85% from service quality and ease of doing business. In other words, the product's not important, the price is not important. What it is is about how you service people and how easy it is to get hold of you. Mm, that's interesting. And actually, if you look at the brands that have emerged from nowhere over the last few years, Amazon, Airbnb, eBay, Expedia, Just Eat, Zappos, Google, Alibaba, all of them, they've all got one thing in common. And the one thing they've got in common is not that they're online. The thing they've got in on common is none of them make the product. They just simply make it available to other people. You need to do that with your own business, to access your IP, to let people get hold of what you're good at. Because most businesses use features. If I go on your website, it'll say, we do this, we do that. We, you and me, we don't care about that. What you've got to do is turn those features into benefits. And once you've got that, you then have to get people to take a test drive. Whatever it is, and I expect many of, you, many of you are doing that, actually give people a go. And that can, I think your website should be a booking site for test drives. All the websites I build now are booking sites for test drives. Here's a, a chiropractor where you can rate your health free. This is their homepage. Rate their health, do a free health check, get a muscle. Here's a, 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 a chemical company where you can talk to an expert, get a quote, request a test kit. Here's another one where you can talk to a specialist or subscribe to their things. These are the kinds of websites. Because I'm 57% into the journey by the time I get there, I want to buy. So to demonstrate what you've got to do is you've got to demonstrate benefit plus test drive. And that takes you to the final level, which is how after engaging, after demonstrating, you find people will buy from you, only then. And here's a health warning. Do not treat your buyers as, as customers. The customer is a C word in our business. The customer is dead. You should treat everybody as a paying prospect. So that even though they're paying, treat them as if they're a prospect. And then the way to do that is to deliver amazing things. And the first thing you need to do is you need to be amazing when actually they buy from you. Think Apple box. If you own an Apple product, you'll understand what I'm talking about. The boxes are amazing. And interestingly enough, interestingly enough, Apple, I recorded a video of how amazing the Apple 3G box is, which is what that is, seven years ago. This is their current commercial. Just 
just a box. The commercial is just a box because the box is a brilliant thing. So you need to make your experience amazing. Um, and finally, what you need to do is to create loyalty, the final step. Say thank you as often as you can. Actually, we're giving them gifts, tips and tricks. You can unlock features, you can give advice, you can recommend a friend scheme, you can add value. There's thousands of ways of saying thank you. Say thank you to the people with whom you do business every day, all of the time. And if you've got your head around creating insights, send them the insights too. It's like the chocolate on the pillow moment in a hotel when you go down to dinner and you come back and somebody's put a chocolate on your pillow. And if you're not drunk, you don't wake up with chocolate on your face, you go, oh, that's nice. What a nice hotel, what, a nice, what they've done. And what it does is it generates repeat purchase and creates advocacy. So to deliver what you should do is systemize your wows and say thank you regularly. Marketing is all about numbers. We're very near the end now. And actually you've got to make sure that to get one paying prospect, you run three to five test drives, which you get 30 to 50 inquiries, and actually you're mopping up the 57% inbound. The one thing I wanna say is you must keep an AI on future relationships. You see what we are looking at now, if you look at this, Alexa is now more used than people listening to a traditional radio by the kids. They know they can request something. Actually, my Alexa has just fired up. It's really interesting. I have to mark that. Um, that has happened in February of this year. So the young generation are coming through now, and they expect to be able to access everything. So the seven pillars to supercharge your brand in the digital economy. Start with your value proposition. Treat everyone as a prospect always, even after they buy from you. Focus on inbound. Forget outbound. Run your marketing as a process. I use my on the ed process, engage, demonstrate, deliver, and then make buying from you amazing. Test and measure everything you do. There is nothing in marketing you shouldn't be testing and measuring. And finally, build valued relationships because ultimately when AI, AI comes, you'll be able to link in with that. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been Barnaby Winter of the Brown Bucket Company. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barnaby. What a great session. And I really like some of the points that you've picked up on there. Um, particularly when I think about some of the training businesses and coaches and educators that I've worked with over the last decade or so. So we're going to move into the Q&A session now and just take on a little bit of uh, queries and things perhaps for Barnaby to answer. So just while those are coming through, I just there's a few key points that I, I picked up on um, whilst you were speaking, uh, Barnaby. I think the first thing is, you know, comparing yourself and keeping an eye on brands like Disney, uh, like McDonald's, like um, FedEx, you know, all of those brands that have been around for quite some time now and hold really strong. One of the organisations that we work with are Pittman Training. And um, Pittman's, if you don't know much about them, are the oldest training company in the UK, founded 200 years ago by Isaac Pittman. Any training business can develop the same reputation as Pittman. And it has been through very much kind of focused branding, as Barnaby's just talked through. Um, you know, your organisation can be there. You absolutely need to think about reaching for the stars. So... If we could just take a couple of questions now from the chat. Um, we've got some great uh, feedback coming through from everybody um, telling us everybody's really thankful and helpful for it. So we'd really appreciate your time there. We, um, we any did particular have a, questions? Or oh, over to Daniel. We did have a question that came in um, from Steve. And that question was, how to best incorporate my value proposition on my website and other social media platforms? Should it be the first thing people see on my homepage? So the, the answer is I should feel your value proposition when I get on your homepage, um, because if you've been using the social media correctly, they will have got your value proposition before reaching your website. Your website tends to be about click number five in the journey to find you. 
you know, I go on, I Google, I type in a word, I click around a few sites, I click on this, and then I end up at your site. And what I would uh, be advocating is that you, you turn your website into it feels and looks like your value proposition. It confirms what I know about you, that you're, you're smart in a particular subject area or whatever. You're a subject matter expert. You've been insightful. You've helped me make sense. And now I can come and talk to you. I can do something with you. Download a white paper, do whatever it is. So your website should reflect your value proposition, not be the first thing they see, but actually guide me to, to have a conversation with, the, with the, the provider of that particular service. Barnaby, just out of interest, because I think that's a really great point there, particularly for trainers and coaches. What would be your simplest definition of a value proposition? You know, for those that are great trainers, great educators and great coaches, but not necessarily so confident in how they build their brand and do their marketing. Well, is... I, I, it's a very, listen, it's a process like everything else. Mm. It's a process. I would go through a process of sitting down very simply with a post-it notepad, cup of coffee, cup of tea, glass of wine, whatever you want to do, and write down everything it's good that you do. Right. And then what you will see is what's good is there'll be style words, there'll be things that you do for people, there'll be clever things that you do, and then your value proposition must emerge from that pool of amazingness. Yeah. Okay. And you'd fill the four Bs, which are your behavioural style, your benefits, what you want people to believe about you, i.e. what you can do for them, and ultimately sometimes it patterns together and you go actually that all looks like a, a lump of granite or a or a, or a daffodil or a, a, an arrow or something it doesn't really matter and that you can make into your brand property and just to sort of link back to your slides so that was the slide with the several circles on correct yes um, yeah okay that, that, now we call that the value proposition because uh, it's a complicated piece and I'm, i'll happily pick up with anybody if they want to talk about it but mm -hmm. actually you can orientate the style values at different people so you can evaluate who you're talking to sometimes they are they're uh, they're analytical sometimes they're amiable some it depends on your own style and if you meet somebody that doesn't match your style don't do business with them under any circumstances do not do business with them because people only buy from people they like who are like them everything yeah. else is a nightmare yeah okay so we, we have, another... have another question oh, sorry um, go on daniel sorry right. sorry we do have another question from nikki um this one should be a good one it said has barnaby helped any coaches and what are his best tips <laughs> yeah so i uh, so i'm currently mentoring 16 people and 11 of them are coaches 16 <laughs> wow. so how do you fit all of that in well they get they get two hours two hours a month <laughs> Um, and at six, so it's only 30 hours, which is less, less than a week, and I work long hours, so that's okay. It's probably only four, four days a month uh, in real terms. Um, what are the tips? The, the, the tips are um, be really confident about what you are good at and then dress that with your style. Okay. Because there'll be lots of people who are good at what you're doing. And often lack of confidence comes with this belief that, A, you've kind of got imposter syndrome. Um, mm. and, and actually just focus on what you're good at. Don't focus on stuff you're not good at or sort of okay at. Focus on what you're really good at. And then you'll find you're not the only one. Actually, you are the only one that's you. And mm. we buy from people we like. So mm. just get you out there with what you're good at. That's where I would start. And actually truthfully i think this underpins mental health and everything we the world keeps telling us that we're inadequate at every level and yet we are all competent at something that no one else is competent at and if it's the same as everybody else we're all very individualistic about how we deliver that competency that's the focus point and then just find people who love you yeah yeah I think that's, you know, that's linking back to a point that we had um, in, a, in a, a couple of sessions ago for some of you that may have attended with Gina Gardner, uh, which was talking about resilience and coping with the psychological pressures of COVID-19. Yes. And um, just picking up on your point there, uh, Barnaby, that, you know, everybody's kind of very critical of themselves you know um we're all our own worst enemy but actually our media and things like that doesn't doesn't help um but what i see and um, you know what i'm absolutely passionate about is when i meet trainers and coaches and educators and speakers like yourselves 
everybody, you're all people that have seen a way to do something differently. And that's why you've developed a course or your educational proposition. And so everybody has a great story because they didn't become a coach or a trainer or an educator or a speaker age 21. No, that's right. You know, so you've all got a great story and it's about having that confidence, as you say, to, to get out there, tell that story and uh, really emanate I, your, your value. Actually, not, not to sort of blow smoke up what, what you guys do, but if, <laughs> if you can then say, we're, I, I'm competent in this area, yeah. I have this style and I've been accredited by a, a, an awarding body for my ability at that. I mm. cannot see why you would lack any confidence whatsoever walking into any room mm. in the knowledge that actually you've got the blend of a, a, an external endorsement from an authority that focuses on not letting people through who aren't any good. Mm. Plus you're good at something. And plus you've got your own personal style. It's, it's, for me, it's almost a perfect formula. So I guess the reason why I'm coaching a lot of people is because I sit there and say, you're great. You, yeah stuff I don't do I want your stuff and even if I don't want your stuff I can find people who do want your stuff mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. I, I think it's a great time to be a, uh, a make sensor rather than a trainer or a coach you know because there's so much knowledge in the digital economy now that people are confused it all looks good now yeah. we as a collective can go into a marketplace and say do you know what we sleep breathe all of this stuff we know what kind of person you are psychographically and let's work together. We're going to find a way, a pathway through all of this amazing stuff so that you're brilliant as well. I think it's a great time to be a trainer or, 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 or a coach or a consultant. I genuinely do. I mean, talking about the times, we've got another question that's coming. Um, it's directed at you again, Barnaby. So thanks, Barnaby. How will digital marketing change when we come out of lockdown? And that's one point. How will digital marketing change when we come out of lockdown? Uh, if you want to reach for your crystal ball, I think it's behind you. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a good one. Um, yeah, so if you go ahead and answer that question, Barnaby, I'm going to run the poll afterwards. I'm quite active in the, in the digital agency arena, so I can give you a, a real life view. Uh, first of all, there won't be anywhere near as many digital agencies as there are at the moment mm. uh, because they're all going to go out of business. The ones that survive, um, I fear for as well because the, the, the problem with the digital uh, agency arena, digital marketing agency arena, is it's replaced what I used to represent, which was the integrated marketing advertising agency arena. So it's just a new version of that. Um, and But the the difference between what we used to call the advertising agencies is we used to start with the strategy, the value proposition. We used to build the brand. Digital marketing agencies have a problem. They are, they are finding ways of working Google or Facebook. And they are, they are the tail wagging the dog of the big social media players. And my fear for them is that what we will find is that business will become more local. I think that business will be more desirable, those that survive, yeah, and get through to 2021. I think people will be really busy with, if they get this story that I'm telling you now right, they'll be inundated with inquiries and they'll be too busy to do any proper outbound marketing. My fear for digital agencies is they still are operating to an outbound marketing strategy mm. rather than an inbound marketing strategy. So the ones that will be survive the ones that will be different are the ones that will be able to sit with you and get you to tell the value proposition identify the psychographic profile and then enable people to find you using the digital arena they will be the survivors in my opinion everybody else will fall by the wayside because what will happen is google will pull their chains create commodity and mm. drive them out of business they're doing it already so so that's my view yeah definitely uh, thanks for that barnaby um, we are just coming down to the final moment, so I'm going to run this poll. Anyone that does want to stay around for another 10 minutes, we have a few more questions. Um, if Barnaby, you're happy to answer those, that would be amazing. I'm happy. I'm on the payroll today. Yeah. Great stuff. <laughs> All right, brilliant. So I'm going to run this web um, sorry, webinar, this poll. Um, this one is just about uh, the next topic or the coming topics that you would like us to touch on. Uh, so if everyone can get ready uh, just to answer this one. And it's, uh, it should be in front of you guys now. Uh, so we're just looking at some future webinars, potential webinars that we're going to be running. 
over the course of the coming months. Um, so if you can engage with that one and just let us know what you guys want, uh, what, what information you guys need at the moment, uh, it would be great. And we'll, we'll look and put those pieces together for you. Okay, we've got the answers coming in now, fantastic. We are gonna go into a couple more answers, questions and answers after this. Uh, so if we can get this done as fast as possible, fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Fantastic, thank you guys. And this actually kind of uh, flows nicely into the next question actually. We've got a question uh, from Peter Johnson. So rather than, um, rather than fail doing everything, uh, where would you focus your time at the moment? So mm -hmm. where would you focus your time at the moment? Um, Barnaby, I've got something to add to that one, but Barnaby, if you, you want to start off. So um, I think if you've got some, some, uh, some time available to you, I would be going back to your business, your business system processes, and I would be finding a way of improving every element of those business and systems and processes, mm -hmm. using time to find better online tools, better ways of communicating, better ways of, and I, what I would be doing is I would be, I would be building your business rocket to sit on the launch pad um, and, and getting ready for takeoff. Because I think what's gonna happen is, is something's gonna break loose very, very out, out of the blue suddenly, and you need to be ready. Mm -hmm. and, and actually the best place to start from a marketing point of view is to develop a value proposition and build your systems and processes to deliver your value proposition in spades. And that's what I will be, and that's what I'm doing with my business. I've gone through every aspect of my business and I've just gone, is that good enough? Could that be better? What can I do? And my goodness, having the extra time to do that, the, the headspace to do that is just extraordinary. Because you go, why do my filing right? Am I invoicing right? Am I collecting the money correctly? Am I Am I uh, generating materials? Am I improving my workbooks? Am I changing my, my speeds? Am I making my imagery better? Am I using a different font? Oh my goodness, every time you do something like you are a gazillions better than, than you were. And it, it, it's what makes the boat go faster. So I would be absolutely spending my time mm -hmm. driving into every element of your business, every system, every process, yeah. and just trying to prove everything. And you'll, what, you'll come out after, after a few weeks and think, I have a completely new, fresh, exciting business that does the same thing, just better and harder. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree with that. And just to sort of add to that before Daniel does, um, I recently had a conversation with a, a great trainer who's, who's um, uh, been training for 20 years. And every time there's been a little bit of downtime or sort of a bump in the economy, um, her expression is, when I've got that time, I refine, 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 so that I become divine. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I'm going to, can I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like I like it. 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 I like it kind of the whole big massive kind of places where you can market came to mind um, and kind of just thinking about which one to target, which one's going to be most profitable for you. Um, and I would say at the moment for, for us as trainers and coaches, I would say the most professional platform um, that I think you, you should be focusing on putting your brand out there on is, is LinkedIn. Um, mm. I think it's a great platform. Um, especially for professionals, uh, most of you are probably targeting professionals. So I say that would be a brilliant place to start. Uh, we are actually that was, and the reason why I got excited as well is because that was in the poll. And guess what won the poll? Um, oh. How to optimize your LinkedIn page to drive connections. Um, so that's definitely going to be one uh, we're going to be putting together for you guys really soon. Uh, we got another question that came in uh, from Michael. And he says, can you give an example of how to turn features into benefits? Oh, okay. So I, 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 Great I, question. I have to reveal a secret to do that. So <laughs> those of you that have stayed with us, it's actually a secret that comes from the agency world. You will have heard it before, but you may not be using it. 
Um, it's very, very complicated. So you're gonna to have to listen very carefully. What you do is you go onto your website and you take the first line that you've written. And at the end of it, you write the following two words, so what? And then you write the answer to that question. And you'll find that it reads much more like a benefit than it does a feature. And mm -hmm. if you keep doing so what, time and time again, eventually you get to stuff, which when you read it, you just think that sounds stonking. And you can do mm -hmm. that with every single piece of communication that you've got and that you've ever done, because I know it'll all be feature-led. And you go, so if you said, I have been training for 20 years, or I've been using the experience of 20 years in industry to become a trainer. Okay, that's not uncommon in, when I visit the kind of websites we do. If you put so what after that, you go, in engineering, there are very few things I haven't seen in the last 20 years. So you can throw me any problem that you would like, and I will know that there's a solution for that. Mm. Now suddenly it sounds like a benefit. So what? So actually, if you are aiming to become future-proof, if you're aiming to be leading edge, I can give you the context of what's been going on for the last 20 years and give you everything you need to know to know where to go next. Now that's just come from the opening statement. So what you, the, the trick is to use the phrase, so what? I know many of you have heard it, your trainers and coaches probably even use it in your gigs, but actually it is the one mechanic that we've used consistently for 30 years to turn a feature into a benefit. And Manly, just a sort of a little question from me on that. So if you struggle to do that, you know, and you're looking at your, I don't know, the answer, um, is it worth sort of pairing up with a friend or a colleague and actually turning that into a conversation and getting them to say so what and you sort of articulating it? I Would you recommend great, that? I mean, a quick 30 minute Zoom with somebody that actually you're better off without a friend or a colleague. Yeah. You're better off with a third party who doesn't really know too much about you. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so a facilitator, and many people on this call will know what the value of facilitation. Um, mm -hmm. So you're right. Get a facilitator for that process if you can't do it yourself. I have to say, if you can't do it yourself, then there's a different question. But, um, uh, but actually, you're absolutely right. If you want to expedite it really quickly, then, then literally book a Zoom call with somebody, say, actually, I'm going to put this up. And they go, so what? And you go, well, because that means this. And they go, yeah, but so what? And you go, well, oh, that's... Okay, that's interesting. So what about that? And what about that? And before you know it, you will have constructed very quickly a whole series of, of amazing benefits, which probably will pattern out into a certain territory that it's, you know, it's always influenced by the East or it's got a spiritual nature or it's got a certain, certain point in time about it. And that can then be the foundation of your brand, brand property as well. It can get, it's a very exciting process, I have to tell you. Okay, brilliant. We've got two more questions and then we're going to round things up. Just before we crack on with those two questions, I do have one more poll. It is concerning the slides that we went through today. I want to test your attention. Uh, so it is going to be a little test on your attention. Let's see how well you do. Uh, get ready for this one. What, what's one key thing should a business do to become a go-to brand? So the answer was revealed in this webinar. So people are taking a bit longer than usual to answer this one. I can see the thinking hats are going on. Um, here we go. Looking good. Looking good. Uh, yeah. Some people are obviously getting it wrong though, um, which is a shame. <laughs> but the majority have definitely got it right. Uh, I'll give you guys five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I, I just on that, Daniel, I don't. If you've got a great value proposition, then actually the best thing you should do is then do your ideal prospect profile. And if you've got both of those, then what you should be doing is focusing on on engaging with people in an entirely yep. different way. So to be fair to the people that answered, I, I'm not I'm not a poll meister on this. We were looking for the answer value proposition. That is the key message. But actually, if you're already confident of that, then then I think the others the others uh, um, are, are are the right sort of approaches. To be fair, 
Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Daniel, sorry to jump in because I can see some people are, are departing now. And um, thank you ever so much for everybody who's attended. Um, just a little message to our members. Um, we've had several specific queries in recently about you know creating engaging content, using quizzes, um, how to donate time and uh, mentoring efforts to the NHS on the front line, uh, good books that you could be reading at the moment to sort of do some CPD for yourselves. So for our members, we'll be holding uh, particular sessions over the next week or so, and also um, distributing some resources on email. So just keep an eye out for those, please. Um, because we obviously, when you're accredited with us, we want to make sure that you're the best that we can be and to answer your specific queries uh, properly with, with good guidance. Definitely, definitely. Okay, um, we'll just go into these last two questions quickly and then we'll round things up. Um, Matthew, thank you for staying with us, those that have. Um, there's another couple questions, really good ones as well. So thanks, Barnaby. This is from Matthew. Uh, thank you, Barnaby. What are the best options for new leads to draw towards your business? My biggest thing. And he says, this is my biggest struggle. So, okay. mm -hmm. so, so I, I would be um, going back to your value proposition. I would be developing insightful material that makes sense of the space that you operate in and and um and then what i would be doing is i would putting out i know you're going to be talking about but i would be writing blogs to go on linkedin i'd be writing a blog to maybe sit in on your website it has to be different i expect i'll tell you that um i'd be tweeting like mad i'd be linking to uh to articles all of which explain how smart you are in your space that demonstrate that you're a subject matter expert that makes sense of that market. And then what you'll find is that people will, will find your material. What I would then do is actively go, one of the clever things to do with LinkedIn is you write a blog and then you pick 20 people who are in your space and send them an early look at the blog. And so I'm writing this blog, you're in my space. I'd be really interested to know, have I captured mm this right yeah. they then come, some one or two will come back and say that's really interesting and then, oddly enough we've just been talking about that on zoom and is that something you do and it's again it's another thing so what the answer is to become actively populating this 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 force field around your your expertise um so that anybody who's now inbound is coming in and then the final thing is go and find your forum or two where you're relevant i don't know what space you're in um, but if you're in a particular space, go into the forums where people are talking about that, go into business groups uh, where they're talking about, you're having no idea what they're talking about. Go to places where the kinds of people you do business with go and just take part. You've got plenty of time to do it. Have fun and be yourself. Just be yourself. They're going to buy you. They're going to buy your expertise and enjoy it. Have fun. Yeah, Thanks, brilliant. Barney. That's some, that's some really useful advice there. Okay, last question, Daniel. Last question from Fennel. And they ask, would you recommend any specific inbound marketing software? Haha. <laughs> uh, Technical one. That, 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 okay, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm software agnostic when it comes, comes to that sort of thing. It's one of the great things of being independent. I have seen immense success for when people understand their level of competency first. Um, and therefore you can choose different platforms based on your competency. Because what actually makes a platform work is you working it. So it has to be something. So you can go at one level, you can go Infusionsoft, you have to kind of have quite a high degree of expertise. HubSpot is making huge headway at the moment. I think Microsoft Dynamics is looking really cool at the moment and Microsoft are piling loads of investment into Teams and linking things up and all that sort of thing. Salesforce is always worth a consideration. Um, and then there are lots of little bits and pieces. Um, uh, it depends how big your business is. I mean, if you're if genuinely, if it's of any, unless it's of, you know, you're talking about a million pound turnover, half a million pound turnover, I, I'd do it manually. <laughs> I'd use a bit of an Excel spreadsheet and just keep a record of who you've spoken to and, and put a callback program into your Google Calendar. I mean, it, you, know, you probably, if you really sit down and think about it, you probably, if you need 10, 20, 30, 30 paying prospects a year, you only need to talk to a couple of hundred people. So if you can't cope with that on an Excel spreadsheet, don't rely on a piece of software to do it all for you. 
Thank you, Barnaby. That's really sage advice. And just before, and just that... before you say, so, Amanda, just before you wrap Sorry. up, last question for you, Amanda. It's going to take you one second to answer this, and then you can say bye. Uh, so this one's from Paul. Thank you, and stay stay alert or stay safe. Which one? For me. Yeah. Which one would you say? Stay Ooh. alert or stay safe? Do you know what? I would say with my psychologist hat on that all of you should be consciously or subconsciously hearing that message that's coming through from the government. Stay home, stay safe, save lives or protect the NHS, whichever way around it is. So subconsciously that should be with you. All right. So if you're staying safe, then your priority is to be alert because as Barnaby's pointed out, this is one of the one times, uh, one of the one time, and I'm not trivializing at all what is going on with COVID-19 It's absolutely devastating. Um, but for those of us who are lucky enough not to be overly affected and are still able to run our businesses, then staying alert and sort of taking uh, some of Barnaby's points on board here, um, is the most important thing you can do because this is where, as we said earlier, you can refine, refine, refine to become divine. Fantastic. Fantastic. Questions are done now, Amanda. Over to you. Wonderful. Okay. Well, just to wrap up, thank you everybody that stayed with us. And um, thank you also to Barnaby for uh, an excellent presentation today. We've had lots of great feedback so far. Well, of course, we'll be circulating the slides and the recording. We will also take on board the strong demand for LinkedIn profiles and building out a session for that so far. And as I mentioned briefly earlier, we're also putting more specific resources together for those of you that are certified with us or certainly those of you that are looking to become a member with us. So thank you ever so much for your time today. And also a huge thank you to Barnaby for sharing his expertise and experience with us. Thank you, Barnaby. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. And yes, LinkedIn profiles may just be up next. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. We're going to be sending out correspondence about next week's webinar mm -hmm. um, on Monday. Yeah. So if we don't see you or speak to you before then, it's next Thursday at two o'clock. So take care. Be well, be safe, but stay alert. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.